All right, here we are at chapter five o'clock. That's on page seven. So you can follow along with me. Arthur and I rolled over on our backs on the warm sandy beach at Mormon Island State Park. We'd just had our first swim of the summer, and now it was nearing five o'clock. You plan to keep going to that crafts class, Arthur asked, putting his hands beneath his head and gazing up at the sky. Now I ought to mention right here at the beginning that my friend Arthur is no ordinary human being. He's smart. He studies things. As Arthur says himself, he cogitates. I could tell by the way he was squinting into the sun that he was thinking hard about something. Miss Stevens, our social studies teacher, pointed out in class one day, Arthur, she said, standing between him and the window, you just have to be the original gazer. Tell me, honestly now, what are you pining for out there that you don't have in here? Freedom, he said. Not sassy like or anything, just stating the facts. Now, lying next to me, he was outlining cloud patterns with his big toe while he gazed. I raised myself on one elbow. Don't you like crafts class? I asked. Not much. I poked finger holes in the sand. Heck, maybe Aunt Goldie had a stomach ache today. Ha! Huh. Maybe she swallowed a prune. Including the pit? Pit, too, I said. And the hairy green worm curled up next to it. That would give her an awesome belly ache. I've never heard of a prune worm. I rolled back onto the sand. Arthur would probably go home and look up prune worms. He has books on everything. Birds, trees, flowers, insects, amphibians, prunes. Bring some Indian craft ideas when you come, Arthur said, mimicking my Aunt Goldie. So I took my idea. She hated it. Oh, she was thinking of basket weaving or pottery painting. You know, something regular. She never have even heard of a bull roarer. She thought I made it up. It's a toy Indian kids used to make, for crying out loud. That thing is authentic. If I'd called it a thunder stick instead of a bull roarer, maybe she'd have... I guess you shouldn't have demonstrated it. You know, right there in her basement under that electric light bulb. I circled my wrist overhead, winding up like some champion calf roper. Then I broke out laughing all over again. Once Arthur got to swinging that bull roarer around his head, once it started whizzing and roaring like a whirlwind, we couldn't hear anything else. Until the sheared off light bulb landed on the ping pong table, that is. I controlled myself. I didn't want big old Arthur to sit on me the way he does when he gets mad. He's not gross, you understand, but he could live on his own fat cells for a month if he had to. Of course, he thinks of that as an advantage. Suddenly, the sun, which had slid out for swimming earlier, disappeared behind the clouds again. This time it looked gone for good. I watched an army of goosebumps rise on my bare belly and thought about starting home. Squinty-eyed Arthur was still climbing the stair steps of a mighty thunderhead with his big toe. I knew he wasn't through brooding about what had happened that morning. If she makes us do rain dances, I'm quitting, he said. Oh, you know my Aunt Goldie. She's such a flake. She forgets half of what she says. Now that everybody wants to make bull roars and nobody wants to decorate pots and stuff, I bet she'll give up on Indian crafts. Goldie, who teaches at the Riverside Dance Studio, also happens to be my mom's younger sister. Because she's divorced and has a hard time supporting herself, I get stuck having to enroll in her personal fulfillment classes every summer. It's the least we can do, Mom says, laying out her case each spring when Aunt Goldie drops off her hundreds of flyers for me to deliver. On my own time, without pay. So far, she's taught Arthur and me how to play hacky sack, tennis, backgammon, and boring bridge. Last summer, we took boys' ballet in her basement while a class of mothers upstairs did aerobic dancing. When Aunt Goldie twisted her knee demonstrating an exercise position for us, she substituted Dungeons and Dragons for the remainder of our ballet lessons. That suited Arthur and me just fine. Let's go, I said suddenly, beginning to shiver. Though the day had been warm and muggy, the weather was changing fast. Arthur sat up and reached for his jeans. I did the same. Little groups along the beach were breaking up, too. Mothers were shaking out towels, yelling for their kids to hurry. We finally... We finished dressing, but not before I spotted Stacy and Ronnie Vay coming toward us across the sand. Arthur chortled as he zipped his up right there in plain sight. He has six sisters, so what does he care? In fact, beautiful 14-year-old Stacy and 10-year-old Ronnie Vay are two of them. I didn't know you guys were here, Stacy said, tossing her long black hair and treating me to a flash of dimples. She knows I have a crush on her. Whoops. 
has known ever since I told Arthur and swore him to secrecy. Where were you guys swimming anyway, she asked. Arthur pointed off to where the Platte River ambles through the state park. We've got this private spot over there with a lot of water snakes. Liar, Stacy cut him off. I glanced Ronnie's way as I knelt to tie my sneakers. She was covered with goosebumps, same as me. Of course, I even have enough, I have enough muscle to keep me warm, but she's so skinny. I imagine it must be embarrassing for her to walk around in a bathing suit. Why don't you two ride us to the Conoco station so I can call mom, Stacy asked, her eyes on me and my bike. We want to get home before it rains. What do you care, Arthur said. You're already wet. You'll ride me double, won't you, Dan? I grinned. I was silly putty in her hands. Well, I'm not waiting around, Ronnie Vay said as she marched off. Stacy's older than Arthur and me by two years, so she's used to getting her own way. She wasn't about to give up. Please, she kept on. I've never been on your new bike. Look, you Stacia Marie, Arthur sneered using her revolting given name. Dan can give you a lift if he's dumb enough to, but I'm not riding Ronnie Vay anywhere. So we wheeled our bikes up to the road with Stacy walking between us. I was longing to have her hanging on my waist while I demonstrated my biceps and quadriceps and my great cycling skills, but I lost out. When Stacy's loyalty to her unfed, underfed sister got the best of her, she ran off yelling for Ronnie to wait up. Clouds were building fast as we started pedaling for home. The way the wind was whipping those trees around the state park should have clued me that something big was on the way, but I wasn't worried then. I figured we were in for more rain, maybe a hailstorm too, if the greenish look of the sky meant anything. Suddenly, I realized I was hungry as a bear out of hibernation. Want to eat at my house? I called to Arthur over my shoulder. What are you having? Well, how should I know? Our voices trailed off in the wind, so we didn't talk much after that. We had a long way to go, and the pumping took all our breath. Thirty or so minutes later, we were cutting across the huge cement parking area that surrounds the Fawner Park racetrack. That's where we always sprint on our bikes. But the wind was so strong, it made speed impossible. Finally, as I was turning the corner onto Sand Crane Drive, a comics page from a newspaper hit my front spokes and immediately got itself shredded. I squeezed my handbrakes and stopped. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A whole ton of newsprint was scattered up and down my street. It looked as if the Grand Island Daily Independent had set out to toilet paper the entire neighborhood. I rested a minute waiting for Arthur to catch up so we could laugh about it together. As I waited, I wiped my face on my damp t-shirt and read Peanuts. Isn't it funny how you remember all the crummy little details on one of those black letter days? My folks say it was that way with them the day President Kennedy was shot way back in 1963. And Belle Smiley, the oldest person in our neighborhood, said she could still remember exactly where she was and what she was thinking on Pearl Harbor Day. I was standing right there inside that screen door, she told me once, after inviting me in for cookies. I was watching a box elder bug crawl across the outside of the screen. I was just standing there, daring that bug to stick his head through a hole we had in the screen. That's when the newspaper boy came by hollering, Extra! Extra! Attack on Pearl Harbor! I didn't move. I just stood there, tears running down my cheeks. I knew my boys would be going off to war, and I knew they mightn't come back. Belle Smiley went on telling me about Pearl Harbor th through four more cookies and a second glass of milk. I swear, I learned more about history from her than I did in school. Anyway, I can remember everything about that Tuesday, too. Every little detail. I remember the bottom-heavy look of the sky and those strong blasts of air that hit us going home. I remember thinking about the girls and being sorry we hadn't given them a lift. I never did get around to raining steady, but the on-and-off-again rain squalls made you think it would. If Ronnie's goosebumps were any indication, the poor girl's bones would be clanking by the time she and Stacy got to that Conoco station to phone their mom. I can even tell you that what we had for supper on that June the 3rd, all I have to do to recall the wonderful smell of our kitchen that night is to close my eyes and inhale. Mom had just taken a chocolate meringue pie out of the oven. All right, so that chapter was 5 o'clock. Next chapter will be 6 o'clock. So stay tuned for that one.